Blessed Lord, our Heavenly Father, You have caused, just like the song says, the Holy Scriptures to be written for us as our foundation for our learning. Father, we pray that You would grant us this morning to hear them as we read, as as we mark them, as we learn and inwardly digest Your Word, Father. May we embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life which You have given us in our Savior Jesus Christ. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Father, give us grace this morning to receive your truth and faith and love and strength to follow on this path that you have set before us. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, have you ever heard someone say that All religions are basically the same. At the end of the day, they all boil down to just a set of moral principles that are basically the same. Islam, Buddhism, Sikhism, Hinduism, uh, Christianity, they all kind of mesh together. Judaism. The truth is that throughout the world, there are many, many different religions. But the thing is this, Christianity is without doubt the strangest out of all of them. Now, living in 21st century America, we might, might be harder for us to see this because we're kind of steeped in a, a culture of Christianity. It's kind of normal to us. It's, it's been going around, it's been around for a long time here. Some of us have grown up in churches and all of us have grown up in a bit historically Christian culture that has been accepting of Scripture. In other words, it's kind of become familiar. Christianity has become familiar to us now. And because we've become so used to it, I think sometimes we've become dulled to how utterly unique and strange it is on the world stage of religions. It's utterly unique. Let's let's think about it for a second. Compare it to a second. Think about Islam. As far as we know, Muhammad died around the age of 63 in Medina with his head being cradled in the lap of one of his 13 wives, Aisha. He was a successful religious and military leader died in old age. He died an honored man. Think about Buddhism. The details life of the Buddha are a little bit more obscure, but again, as as far as we know, he died in old age, sometime in his 80s, respected as a teacher, revered greatly by his people as a wise sage. Perhaps Confucianism. The famous philosopher Confucius died, again, in old age, somewhere in his 70s, teaching, and interestingly enough, Uh, has over 2 million registered descendants alive today across the world. All of these these teachers, all of these founders of world religions died in old age, respected, and greatly enjoy a long-lasting legacy. And And then there's Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. His life could hardly have been more different from these other religious teachers. First of all, he only ministered for three years, and his three-year-long ministry ended violently and abruptly when he was hauled away by Roman guards, according to the screams and desires of his very own people. He was drugged before councils. He was spit on. He was beaten to a bloody pulp and mocked and cursed at. His flesh was torn from his body, a crown of thorns mockingly shoved down onto his head, and he was nailed to a cross outside of Jerusalem, just like a common criminal, like a slave. All but one of his disciples had deserted him at this point. He died to the sounds of jeering and mocking. Criminal's death in the eyes of the people, forsaken and cursed by God. He was buried in a borrowed tomb and left to rot. So, so if you've never thought about this, if you're here today and you've never thought about how utterly unique Christianity is, and you've, you've kind of always thought it was just, again, another religion that basically boils down to the same thing, I want to urge you to listen with fresh ears this morning as we explore what the Bible has to say about this. Christianity is, is not just another religion with a Jesus wrapper on it. It's utterly unique, entirely set apart utterly distinct from other religions. I mean, and again, think about it. Think about it a little bit more. He didn't, Jesus didn't die in old age. 
As far as we know, he died when he was about 33 years old. Utterly humiliating. A disgraceful death. I mean, we, again, we're kind, of, we're kind of dulled to the shock of a death on a cross because we, we have crosses everywhere now, but the cross, it, it's, like, it's like if we had a picture of an electric chair just on the back. It's kind of strange when you think about it. It's a shameful, disgraceful way to die, utterly humiliating, completely degrading. And that is exactly what we're going to see this morning in our text. That is exactly what the Apostle Paul is going to emphasize this morning in Philippians chapter 2. And and the the shocking truth is that ultimately Paul's going to urge us as believers in Christ to be like him in this same sense. To be willing to suffer and utterly humiliated for the sake of each other. He's going to urge us to go out of our way to put our brothers and sisters' needs ahead of our own. To sacrifice like Christ, life and limb for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of each other. Now, we're going to do something a little bit strange. Uh, You may notice on your bulletin it says we're going to be looking at Philippians 2, 6 through 11. So we're going to skip 1 through 4, 1 through 5, and we're going to go back to those next week. And here's why. Um, First of all, 1 through 11 is really one contained unit of thought. Um, but as I was looking at it, I realized we, we couldn't go into the depth that I wanted to go to if we, if we did it all at one time. So what we're going to do is we're going to see Christ this morning in 6 through 11, what Paul is teaching us about Christ. And then next week, we're going to go back to 1 through 4 and apply how that applies to our relationships with each other and what Paul is saying about the nature of our relationships and what mindset we should have. He gives Christ as the prime example of a humble mindset. And that's what we're going to see this morning. We're going to, we're going to look in depth at 2, 6 through 11. We're going to mine the, the depth of the riches of the theology contained in here. And then next week we'll see what that means for our community, for our relationships. We're going to kind of pull this passage out a little bit and, and see it from some different angles. We're going to see what it reveals about Jesus Christ. It's going to be a little bit backwards, but I think for our context and our time, it will make more sense and be a little bit more impactful. So again, I would encourage you this week, as as you're going through your week, be reading 2, 1 through 11, and we'll look at it next week. So a quick kind of review of the context of Philippians, because this is going to be especially important this morning. Paul is writing this letter to the Philippian church in the city of Philippi. Philippi is in Greece. Philippi is an official Roman colony, which kind of sets it above the other Cities. None of the other cities that Paul wrote to in, in the scriptures are Roman colonies. So it's a Greek city, but it's a Roman colony. So it's Roman in culture. Even the architecture, as we talked about, was laid out to model the city of Rome. People during this day knew it as Little Rome. So we kind of have Little Korea, you know, things like that, Koreatown. This was known, Philippi was known as Little Rome. The Greek, Greek was the language of all the surrounding cities, but in Philippi, they spoke mostly Latin. All the signs were in Latin. We've dug them up. We know, we know what they say. Philippi was a bastion of Romanness in a Greek world. Again, the, the language was Roman, the architecture was Roman, and the culture was Roman. Now, all this is to say, kind of point out one thing. In Philippi, what was important to the people, one of the cultural markers of Roman society was honor. Honor and status, that is what they pursued. That was their pursuit as individuals and as a society, status. Their their culture was so focused on this, in fact, that that we can tell just by examining archaeologically what is found in the city. See, the average person's goal in life was to attain the highest status, the most honor that is possible in this life, climb the social ladder, so to speak. Their society was so concerned with this type of thing that they had official titles for everything. And if you read Acts 16, you'll notice that Paul uses official titles of the people in Philippi different than he does anywhere else in the book of Acts. Luke is, Luke is telling us something there. They had class systems. There was elite classes of people, soldiers and Roman citizens and kind of the everyday average Joe. Even in their, even in their theaters and in, in the Colosseum there in Philippi, 
they had different sections, depending on which class you were, you would sit in a different section. So imagine like Angel Stadium over here, depending on, oh, you know, I'm a Roman citizen. Okay, you can go up to the second tier. Oh, I'm a veteran soldier. Oh, you go down to the first tier. So everything was designated by classes, by status, by how much honor you had. And that's not even the best of it. Now, we like to brag a lot as a society, right, on our social media and things like that, but Philippi took it to a whole nother level. The citizens of Philippi, again, and I talked about this in our first sermon, but they, they would pay huge amounts of money to fund some building project, a statue, a fountain, something like that, and then they would inscribe their own accomplishments on it and all of their titles that they had achieved in their life to leave a legacy and to achieve status for themselves. They would list for everyone to see how high they had ascended the ladder of honor. That was the norm. This was, this was the culture. You spent your entire life, at the expense of everyone else oftentimes, trying to achieve the highest status and the most power for yourself, right? And we understand that. Our, our, our culture is somewhat similar. Bigger house, better cars, nicer clothes. It's somewhat similar to the American dream. And this is exactly the mentality that Paul is going to just blow to smithereens here in Philippians 2. See, Paul takes aim at this culture of the Roman city of Philippi and destroys it through the example of Christ. Paul constructs, in a sense, a statue for Jesus, but instead of ascribing his ascent, he describes his descent into into humiliation. And so as we read this passage, you're going to see this. Paul's intentionally structuring this as a complete opposite of what the Philippian society was used to. Jesus, instead of going from shame to honor, descends from honor to shame. Yeah, (laughs) He's the opposite of all this Roman culture. He sets an entirely new precedent, an entirely new principle, an entirely new standard. Jesus accomplishes his glory through shame, through humiliation. Again, while the Romans spent their entire life trying to ascend in status, Jesus gives up everything to descend in status. He pursues glory through humiliation. But how does this work? How does the Christ achieve glory if he's humiliated? How can shame lead to exaltation? Why do we worship, again, a humiliated man? Well, Paul answers the question in this text. And the main main thrust of this passage is that because Christ made himself low, God has lifted him on high. Because Christ made himself low, God has lifted him high. Now, there's essentially two pieces to this passage. There's Christ's descent into humiliation and then Christ's ascent. And so that's how this passage breaks down. We're going to see those two things. So grab your Bible, turn to Philippians 2. We're going to start in verse 6. Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 6. And you're going to need to follow along here this morning because it's incredibly important to see this with your own eyes. So the first thing we're going to see, the first section we're going to see of this text is that Christ made himself low, the descent of Christ. Now notice where Paul starts. Paul is going to start at the height of Christ's glory. So look at it. Look at verse 6. Speaking of Jesus, he says, though he, Who though he was in the form of God. So, so here's what we see just from this. Jesus was in the form of God. Well, what does that mean? It simply means that he was in outward and inward appearance God. He was in the fullest sense God. He's not part of God. He's not a creation of God. He is God. Now, this is all taking place before the incarnation, before he becomes a man. So what Paul is saying here, what we clearly see about Jesus is that he was God in in the form of God, meaning he is the fullness of God. He was divine. He could claim equal status with God, to put it another way. And nobody claims equal status with God unless they are God. Now, sometimes you'll see, you know, so-called scholars and internet atheists running around on the internet arguing that the early Christians never believed that Jesus was God. That was something that was invented hundreds of years later. But this is one text out of many that clearly shows that to be utterly ridiculous. This singular verse, or this really the singular half of a verse, also refutes the Jehovah's Witness position that Jesus was some type of creation of God the Father. No, Jesus is not a created being. He's not a lesser God. He's not a lesser being. 
He existed before the world was created and everything was created through him. We see that in this simple text. We see this truth also laid out clearly in Jesus' prayer to the Father in John 17, 5, where he says this, Jesus says, And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. So clearly Jesus was with the Father in glory before the world existed. Hebrews 1, 3 gives us an even clearer picture by declaring this of Jesus, that he is the radiance of the glory of God in the exact imprint of his nature. So clearly what we see in this verse then is that Jesus was divine, existing with the Father and the Spirit before the world existed, existing with the Father and the Spirit for all eternity. Jesus Christ is equal with God the Father. Jesus held full status as God. But what does he do with that status? So he's starting at the top. It doesn't get any higher than full status of God. What did he do? Did he, did he use it for his own benefit? No. Look what Paul says next. We see this, that Christ, he did not consider his identity, his status, as something to be exploited. Paul says it this way in the rest of, uh, rest of verse 6. He did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. So though he was in the form of God, he did not count it as something to be grasped. Okay, so we're going one step lower. He had equality with God. He was in nature God, and yet he did not count this as something to be grasped, as something to be held on to, as something to be held on to for dear life. In other words, what Paul is saying is he did not consider his status as God as something to be used for his own advantage. You see what Paul's beginning to do here? Jesus didn't view his status, his power, as as something to be used for himself. He didn't grab hold of his status and say, mine, everyone bow to me. No, even though it was rightly his, he did not use it for his own advantage. Now, think about this, because it's strange. And there's not really... It's, it's hard to even find words to describe the idea that is contained here. God himself, in his status as God, did not consider his godness to be used for his own advantage. The Son of God, in other words, did not consider his status as something to be leveraged for his own benefit. Though the glory of God in all of its fullness was rightfully Christ, he chose to set it aside and descend into humiliation. That's a striking, a striking thought. And again, I think because, especially if you've grown up in the church, we can kind of get used to this sort of thing, but it doesn't make any sense. Set aside the glory of God to be humiliated? Why? Why? What we see in this text is because That is what God is like. That is what God is like because of his love for us. And it's important to to realize that the reason that Christ does this is not contrary to his nature, but in fact, it reveals his deepest nature, character. This is is not a choice on Jesus' part that he was forced to make. He joyfully, Hebrews tells us, endured the cross, endured humiliation, on our behalf, because of his great love for us. He willingly set aside his status for our sake, because that is who he is. There is no other God like this in the history of world religions, except Christ. Think about it in relation, even just to like the Roman and Greek God myths. They operate entirely for their own advantage. That's why people are always trying to do all this stuff to get them on their side, because they've got to give them some motivation. Hey, there's something in it for you too. It's an utterly foreign concept. Even in Islam, it's an utterly foreign concept. Islam views the idea of incarnation as blasphemy. God can't become a man. That would be humiliating. That would be revoking his status. And in a sense, yeah, it would. Christ humiliated himself. This is the God that we serve. And this, this already is almost unbelievable. Just, just this, this verse right here. God setting aside his divine privileges? What is this? But Christ descends further. He descends further. Look, look at what it says. The next verse, verse 7, says that he emptied himself. It says this, but, but emptied himself by taking the form 
of a servant or slave, being born in the likeness of men. So Christ takes another step down the ladder of humiliation. Not only did he not count his status as God as something to be taken advantage of, he emptied himself of it and took the form of a slave. And, and don't misunderstand, this text is not saying that he emptied himself of his divinity or anything like that. He didn't cease to be God. He emptied himself of the privileges of divine status. Augustine puts it this way, Christ emptied himself not by losing what he was, but by taking to him what he was not. He didn't get rid of his Godhead, but rather he took humanity to himself. That's the wondrous mystery. Like we sung, it's a wondrous mystery. He set aside his glory that he had with the Father and instead chose to display his divinity by becoming a human, a true human. And don't forget that Jesus was truly a man. Sometimes we focus so much on his deity, we forget that he was truly human. If you saw him, you would just think he was an average guy. He got hungry, tired, frustrated, and angry, of course, without sin. But he was truly a man. He was truly God and truly man at the same time. This is the wondrous mystery of the incarnation. But he didn't just become any human. No, he became a, a slave, Paul says, a servant. He came here to be a servant of mankind. Have you ever thought about that? God came to serve us. Again, don't let that slip by. It's a scandal. It doesn't make any sense. It's it's unreal. Why would God do that? The God of the universe becoming a slave? Who would trade the highest status for the lowest status? Well, Jesus, our Savior, would. Because that is who he is in his deepest nature. He is the one who willingly endured humiliation to serve us. He endured this on our behalf. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. Listen to that again. For for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, he had status as God, yet for our sake he became poor. He took on the form of a slave. So that you, by his poverty, might become rich. See the power in those words. He is so graceful, so merciful, so full of love for his people that he set aside his riches and became utterly poor so that we, by his poverty, by his humiliation, might become rich. That we might attain honor through his humiliation. He didn't deserve any of this. The status is, his status as God is rightfully his. And yet, he sacrificed for us. That's the wondrous mystery. And we've got to hear this with fresh ears this morning. Don't don't let this slip by. Don't don't take Jesus for granted. Don't, Don't let your hearts be dulled to this truth this morning. This is why we always need to hear the gospel. We need to be reawakened to the the mystery of this truth daily. Let us never become used to these words that, that God took on the form of a slave. It's just, it just, on the stage of world religion, makes no sense. It's utterly unique. But the descent doesn't even stop there. This is shameful. Again, in Roman society, the, the status of a slave was about as low as you could get. But it gets even worse. Jesus descends even lower into degradation and hum- humiliation. And again, remember this Roman society that we talked about. They would be hearing this about Jesus just utterly confounded. They would realize that this goes against everything they believed. This is is the rock bottom of shame and humiliation. And let's pause here before we get to this next verse. 
Because I, I want to prepare our hearts for what Paul says next. Soften your hearts to hear the utter humiliation that Christ endures here. Jesus in glory, equal with God the Father and the Spirit, and yet he decides to pursue humiliation willingly. He lets go. He sets aside his divine privilege and pursues humiliation. He's born as a man, a poor man, a slave. And that's not even the depth of his degradation because it gets even worse in verse 8. Paul teaches us that Christ humbled himself to the lowest and most shameful position possible. Look at verse 8. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And the thought of this is, is, is insa- it's, it's crazy. It's insane. The God of the universe became obedient to death? What? I mean, in our culture, it, it strikes us a little bit less, I think, than the Philippians, because in our culture, humility is kind of thought of as a virtue, right? But not in Roman culture. There, you can read Romans talking about this. They, they didn't view humility as a virtue. They would have been hearing this, Jesus was a fool, a disgrace, a humiliating, shameful human being who deserved nothing but the scorn and shame and ridicule that he got. This is why Paul says that the cross is foolishness. They would have, this is ridiculous. Why would I follow this guy? And, and it's not even as if Jesus was humbled or forced into it. No, the text says he humbled himself. Nobody humbled Jesus. He humbled himself. He willingly endured and brought upon himself this shame and disgrace and humiliation. He willingly bore our burdens. He chose this. It didn't happen to him. He made it happen. The God-man, Jesus Christ, by whom all things were created and all things came into being, became obedient to death. You understand what this means? You understand what this took? Death could not take him without his permission. He was God. Yet by his own extreme act of humiliation, he gave himself over to death. He let death separate him from his body. He physically died. That is utter debasement. The degradation, the, the ultimate lowering. He gave up his life for us. And even that is not enough because Paul adds one last emphatic statement to the humiliation of Christ. It's not just that he, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death. Paul says, even death on a cross. Now again, to us, this doesn't strike us as strange because we're so used to it. But don't, don't miss this. What Paul is trying to get the Philippians to notice here is the type of death that Jesus endured. It's not the physical pain of the cross that's in view here, although that was great, of course. What he's trying to get the Philippians to notice is the utter humiliation of death on a cross, the utter shamefulness that crucifixion brought with it. You see, in the ancient world, crucifixion was only partly invented for the physical pain of it. It was, the, 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 the point of it really in an ancient culture was the humiliation of it, the shame that it brought. It was the worst, most humiliating, degrading way you could possibly die. Nailed to a piece of wood, lifted up, most of the time naked, and placarded before the passing crowds a filthy, lowly criminal. In fact, the Romans viewed crucifixion as so humiliating and degrading that if you were a a legal Roman citizen, it was actually illegal for you to be crucified. You could not be crucified no matter how bad your crime, even for treason. You could not be crucified because they just viewed it as simply too disgusting for a Roman citizen. The only people who could rightfully be crucified were the lowest of low criminals 
and slaves. That's it. In fact, they thought crucifixion so humiliating, so horrific, that the word cross in Latin was essentially a swear word to Roman society. Cicero, the famous Roman writer, writing it about 60 BC, he says this. Listen to what he says. Let the very name of the cross be far away, not only from the body of a Roman citizen, but even from his thoughts, his eyes, and his ears. He says, this is such a shameful thing to even, you shouldn't even think about it if you're a Roman citizen. You shouldn't even hear about crucifixion. You shouldn't even see one because it's just so humiliating. Crucifixion was reserved for just the absolute scum of the earth, of Roman society, the slaves, the criminals, people who had zero rights. In fact, that was one nickname that the Romans gave crucifixion. They called it a slave's death. Almost the, the person who could be crucified was almost inhuman, according to their eyes, subhuman. Because that is the only type of person that would be fit for a death such as this. The lowest of the low, the trash of society. The Jews even taught, rightfully so from Scripture, that anyone who was crucified was cursed by God and automatically cut off from the people of God. This is the death that Christ bore for us. That's, that's what he's doing when he's hanging on the cross. The creator of all things, by whom all things came into existence, nailed to a cross, nailed to a tree, cursed and forsaken by God, covered in his own blood, crown of thorns, digging into his skull, covered in the saliva of Roman soldiers, humiliated, degraded, executed like a slave, murdered as a spectacle for all to see. That's the death that we deserve to die. That's the point. That was our cross to bear as enemies of God, not his. It wasn't his death. We are the guilty ones. We are the criminals. We are the traitors. We are the ones who've sinned against an almighty, holy, perfect God. He was innocent. He was completely innocent. You and I, we know this. We know this. We all have a laundry list of sins and horrible things that we have thought and committed. We are sinful people. And yet in the midst of our sin, in the midst of our sin, knowing full well our hatred and rebellion against him, God the Father looked on us with mercy and love. And he sent his own son to rescue us, the scriptures teach us. It's as, it's as if Jesus said they are, they are, they are utterly sinful and deserving of my wrath, but I love them and I will take their place. I will take the punishment for all of the horrible things they have done. I will endure humiliation on their behalf. I will endure the wrath of Almighty God on their behalf. You see, we have this weight on our shoulders. It's a, it's a burden. It's called sin. And whether you say you believe it or not, you know it's true deep down. We stand guilty before God. But the beauty of this is that we don't have to because of Jesus' sacrifice. Because of him, we can now have that weight removed and the burden taken off our shoulders. That's the beauty of the gospel he took it for us. And so now by faith in Christ, we can give that burden to him. He calls men and women to himself for this very purpose. And we'll see this in the next section. So that is Christ made low. He's gone from status with God to a slave's death. But you see, Christ didn't stay there. Because the result of, of Christ's humiliation, Paul tells us next, you see, because... Christ made himself low. God has lifted him high. Look at verse 9 through 11. Paul says this, Therefore, therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul says here that because of the self humbling of Jesus. 
he is now exalted to the highest place of all. Jesus is now bestowed and given the name that is above every other name. And in light of the Old Testament, it's very clear this is the name of God, the name of Yahweh. The name, Lord of lords, Lord of all things. This is the goal and the result of his humbling. He has been exalted, lifted up, and glorified for the world to see. He has been vindicated. He has been officially titled Lord of lords, King of kings. He possesses all authority on heaven and earth. And notice where the text goes next. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, every tongue should confess. What does this mean? It means that one day Jesus will be officially vindicated. It means that one day when he returns, all people will submit to Christ. One day all people, all creatures in every realm, whether spiritual or physical is what Paul's getting at, all will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. All will see him for who he truly is when he comes again in glory. Now, this is at the same time the most terrifying and the most relieving thing that could be uttered. You see, it's relieving and beautiful for those who are Christ's people. And it's terrifying for those who reject him as Lord. When Christ returns, Revelation teaches us that his people will be overflowing with joy. And yet those who reject Christ in Revelation cry out for the rocks to cover them from the wrath of the Lamb. Paul is kind of co-opting the words of Isaiah here. We read it this morning, but it says this in Isaiah chapter 45, verse 22. Turn to me and be saved. All the ends of the earth. God is calling everyone, just turn to me and be saved. For I am God and there is no other. There's no other way to salvation. By myself I have sworn from my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return. To me, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. Notice who Paul applied those words to, Christ. Only in the Lord it shall be said of me, our righteousness and strength. To him shall come and be ashamed all who were incensed against him. In the Lord, all the offspring of Israel shall be justified and shall glory. The question is this morning, looking at this text, will you be found righteous? Or will you be found in shame before God at the end of days? You see, this text, like many other in Scripture, divides all of humanity into two camps. Those who willingly and humbly acknowledge Jesus Christ now, and those who will one day be forced to acknowledge Jesus Christ in utter defeat. You see, we're living in the process of this becoming a reality. We are headed towards that day. But one day... When Jesus returns, it's all going to be finished. Everything will be over. There's no more chance. We will all stand before him, accountable to him. Every single one of us and every knee will bow to Christ. Some to righteousness, some to shame. Some to eternal life and some to eternal condemnation. That is what the scriptures teach us. Those who freely acknowledge him as Lord will reign with him in glory forever in fullness of joy. Those who reject him will be forever cast away in darkness, condemnation. And this is a glorious truth because it means that one day, as as Revelation teaches us, all things will be made new. All will be set right. Pain will be gone, sin gone, death gone, Satan gone, and every evil thing done away with. And those who are in Christ, will live in fullness of joy in the very presence of our King and Savior in glory for all eternity. Imagine that day. You see this this passage, it lays out two paths before us this morning. The path of life and the path of death. The path of Christ as your Savior and the path of Christ as your judge. The path of the mercy of God and the path of the wrath of God, the path of eternal joy and happiness, the path of eternal sorrow and condemnation. There's only these two paths. There's no third way. The question is, which path are you on? Which path are you heading down? What what makes the difference? It's simple. Those who have put their faith in Christ are on the path to life. 
Those who reject Christ are on the path to death. There is salvation under no other name than Jesus. John writes this in chapter 3, verse 36. It's simple. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. That is a terrifying reality. If you do not believe and obey the Son, the wrath of God remains on you. It is hovering over you. And so, in light of this text, I would address those of you here this morning who may not know Christ, who reject Christ. If your faith is not in Christ, I would call you. Why? Wait. Come to Christ now. If you will repent and turn towards Christ, he will have you today. He will be your Savior. It doesn't matter how much wicked things you have done. That's not the point. Christ will have you. He is full of grace and mercy. Full forgiveness is available for all those who will cast themselves upon the mercy of Christ, who will believe in the sufficiency of his crucifixion and resurrection. So I would urge you today, don't be numbered among those who reject Christ. Don't be numbered among those who will one day bow the knee in humiliation. Turn to yourself, turn to him this morning and cast yourself upon the mercy of Christ. and Cry out to him to prayer and he will save you. All that this means is is stop trusting in your own abilities. Stop trusting in your own goodness and your own works. They're not good enough, but Jesus's are. And he will give them to you if you will put your faith in him. Admit your weakness. Come to him humbly. Turn from your sinful ways and cast yourself upon the mercy of Christ. And to my brothers and sisters in the faith, I simply say this. Behold your God. Be refreshed this morning in the good news of the gospel. I don't know where you're at in your faith. Maybe maybe you're struggling this morning. Let me encourage you. Be reminded of the amazing, indescribable love of God that we see in Jesus Christ in this text. For your sake, he became poor that you might become rich. For our sake, he became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. So maybe you're here this morning and you're, you're struggling, you're doubting God's love for you. But think of what this text says. Look at what Christ did for you when you were an enemy of God. Go to him and be refreshed in his grace. Be amazed this morning at the the beauty of the gospel. May the greatness and the graciousness of Christ renew your strength as you seek to daily turn away from sin. May the greatness and graciousness of Christ renew our hearts to worship. May we behold the wondrous mystery anew. Let us join Christ on this path of humiliation. And in the end, we also will be exalted with him. And to us as a church, I would simply say, let us spread this good news all over the city of Orange. Let us not keep it bottled up or within these walls. May the gospel of Christ go forth from this place to the glory of God the Father. So in this passage, brothers and sisters, we have seen the glory of Christ. We have seen our our Savior and our Lord humiliated. This, This is our God who loves us so dearly and whom we love so much. This is the utter humiliation and exaltation of Christ. It's the beauty of the cross. I'd like to end just by reading one verse from that song we just sang, Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery. What a foretaste of deliverance. How unwavering our hope. Christ in power resurrected as we will be when he comes. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we we stand in awe of you this morning. I'm, I'm almost moved to speechlessness the sight of Christ on the cross, humiliated in our place. Father, it may be impossible, but but help us to grasp the depth of what this means. Help us to grasp the depth of your love for us. Help us to see the beauty of Christ 
And in light of that, help us to see the utter worthlessness of everything else. And Father, I pray for those here, anyone here who doesn't know you, Father, open their heart that they may grasp this beauty with us. Give them eyes of faith to see. Bring them into the kingdom of Christ. Father, we we thank you. And in looking forward to next week, we pray that you would begin to work in our hearts. That we too may have the mindset that was in Christ. Father, we know that all these things are only possible by the power of your Holy Spirit and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. That name at which every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. So we pray in his name. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Walking in Faith. We encourage you to share this with others. If you have any questions or comments, please visit us online or email us at info at orangevilla.org. Till next time, may God bless you in everything you do.